Do you remember chain letters back in the day? You know, you'd get a piece of paper or whatever. You had to do whatever it said and pass it on to the next person. Well, all these years later, we found a way to bring that to YouTube. And you know what? It's fun. So why not? I'll take the bait. Here is my top five favorite key comics in my collection. This started out as a tag video proposed by Alex, the comic book hoarder. My buddy Ryan over at Automatic Comics picked up the uh, torch and ran with it and I got tagged. So here we go. I've got some crazy stuff and honestly, it took me a little bit to sit down and figure out what I wanted to pull for this video. But I think after a little bit of thought and a little bit of time, I've come up with the books that really I think are the most important to me or, or are my absolute favorite. So let's kick this off. It's not gonna be any surprise. Everybody knows I'm a huge Spider-Man fan and that I'm a Green Goblin fan on top of that. So where do we work that into the video? And my first choice is Amazing Spider-Man number 121. This is a CBCS 9.6 copy I picked up a while ago. I bought this bad boy raw and had it graded. Um, just an absolutely beautiful copy of this book, that Marvel yellow, um, you just can't beat it. So I love this book and am very happy to have it. And it's just one of those things, it's like, it's a defining moment. There's probably no more defining moment than the death of Gwen Stacy in this issue of Amazing Spider-Man in the entire run of Spider-Man outside of the burglar killing Uncle Ben in Amazing Fantasy 15. So that is, in my opinion, the second most important Spider-Man issue ever. It's just had more ramifications, more impact on the character than any other moment outside of you know that origin story in AF-15. So naturally, with it being Green Goblin related, super important to Spider-Man, that's a book that just holds a lot of importance to me and I absolutely love it. Plus that John Romita cover's great. Next book, let's just get this out of the way. Everybody also knows I'm a huge Ninja Turtles fan. So of course there's gonna be a Ninja Turtles book on this list. And this is what I've shown off recently because I just got it not too long ago. But this is my CGC 9.4 TMNT number two first print. This is a key for several reasons. Um, most notably, probably it's the first appearance of April O'Neil, which I mean, yeah, people say she's probably important to the whole turtle thing. But I'm a huge Mouser fan. So the Mousers are my favorite TMNT villain. And this is their first appearance as well. And Baxter Stockman uh, makes his debut here as well. Of course, he's the scientist who creates the Mousers. So yeah, what else was I gonna pick? Of course, you've got this nice wraparound cover. Um, the Mousers were originally designed by Peter Laird. According to uh, some talks I've had with Kevin Eastman, this was kind of a concept Peter came up with, but I love this book. And um, yeah, it was gonna be on there no matter what. The next book may be a little bit surprising, honestly. Um, it's not something I talk about a lot, but recently I've gotten into collecting, and by recent, I mean, you know, the last several years, I've started picking up some Golden Age Archie books. And, you know, those can be kind of few and far between, um, at least locally. When I go to some bigger shows, I can generally find some. But the Golden Age stuff can be a little pricey, particularly the very early stuff. Um, and that's ultimately what I've chosen to collect is I want to stick to like the pre-code Archie. So the comics code came in in 1954. I want to stay or before that, below that. One um, exception I make to that rule is I really enjoy Sabrina the Teenage Witch, which, I mean, that should not be surprising. I was born in the 80s, came of age in the 90s, right? So TGIF was a huge thing um, in my household. Every Friday night, if we were home, the TV was on ABC and we were watching TGIF. And of course that meant by the mid 90s, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, uh, the Melissa Joan Hart show, came on and introduced me to that character. At the time, I didn't really know much about Archie comics, but now I know. So 
my third book I picked for this is my copy of Madhouse 22. This came out of a local collection that walked into the uh, comic shop I used to work at here in Columbia. And it was just one of those things. I was actually the one working on processing the collection and I didn't really know a lot about Archie stuff at the time. So I was going through just checking stuff, uh, pricing it, bagging it and boarding it. And when I got to this book, I looked it up and I was pretty blown away because I had no idea it was the first appearance of Sabrina. So I did my thing. I priced it and I took it in the shop and I said, hey, I'm going to buy this. So I got my employee discount on it and I got to add this thing to my collection. And this was well before Chilling Adventures of Sabrina came out and really kind of put a lot of heat on this book. So it wasn't inexpensive, but it was nowhere near um, what it is now cost wise. And yeah, it is coming down some now um, just because the show's kind of fading out a little bit and been off the air for a bit. But it's still a pretty dang tough book to find in any grade. So I mean, it's not the prettiest copy in the world, but. I don't need that. I'm just happy to have that uh, hole filled and uh, say I have one. So Archie's Madhouse 22. That's my third book. My fourth book. I'm a big pre-code horror fan, especially EC stuff. You know, just the Tales from the Crypt TV show. I've told the story many times about staying up super late on Saturday nights just to watch uh, some of those reruns you know, heavily watered down versions of those reruns and syndication. Um, so when I got back into comics and kind of really got established and, and got tired of just collecting superheroes, the first place I started looking was EC Horror. As you may know, that stuff doesn't come around a lot. Um, I think it was about 10 years ago, a solid six or seven years after I'd gotten back into collecting during college that I was able to buy my first EC originals, um, which is how we kind of tend to describe them because they've been reprinted however many times over the years through various companies. Um, but yeah, it was, I think, Planet Comic Con 2013 when I bought my first stack of ECs. Um, I actually remember where I got them. I bought them from uh, Dale Roberts, who is a Kentucky-based dealer he has his own website sells a lot of big books um back then they weren't inexpensive but again nothing like they are now but the book i'm going to show now which is my number i guess if i was doing this in reverse order this would be my number two book um is crypt of terror 17. this is the first time that the Tales from the Crypt title kind of gets in it, it's its own thing. Uh, so it started out as the Crypt Keeper's debut was in Crime Patrol 15. Issue 16 was also horror stories, but under that uh, crime title. Issue 17, they finally changed it over to a terror title, but they weren't done yet. It actually became Tales from the Crypt in issue 20. Um, so if you ever see Tales from the Crypt 20 and then in parentheses number one, that's because it's the first issue of that title, despite the fact that it's actually the sixth issue ultimately um, since the Tales from the Crypt story started, like I said, in Crime Patrol 15. But Crypt of Terror 17 is a Johnny Craig cover. It's a werewolf cover. I absolutely adore the werewolf covers that EC put out. Some of the Jack Davis ones are especially good. Um, Tales from the Crypt 46, the last issue, is probably my absolute favorite. And the interesting thing about that is, so this is Crypt of Terror. It ran for three issues, 17, 18, and 19. When they changed the name of the series to Tales from the Crypt, they shelved the Crypt of Terror title. What was happening, what was kind of in the works at the time, that EC got shut down uh, following the, you know, uh, subcommittee on juvenile delinquency was EC was actually working to expand their horror line. They were going to bring back Crypt of Terror as a fourth terror or horror title and 
then they'd have four books every month um, under their horror line. The final cover for Tales from the Crypt there in issue 46 was actually supposed to be the cover of the first new issue of Crypt of Terror. So if you ever find a Crypt of Terror number one that has the cover of Tales from the Crypt 46, I think it was printed sometime in the 70s. It's actually, that's what was supposed to happen if, you know, parents wouldn't have got their panties in a twist and thought that comic books were the devil or whatever, you know, that would have been how that cover was actually known. But, you know, it went down the way it is and that was it. So we got it for the last issue of Tales from the Crypt. But this issue is, yeah, it's a restored 3.5. That's a bummer, but I didn't care. I literally... When I saw it, I stopped mid-sentence because I was talking to the guy. And I, I got this one from Harley Yee. Uh, I don't remember where we were at. Maybe St. Louis. Uh, Middle Wizard World or something, I think. And I was talking to him, and we were having this conversation. And I saw this book, and I just, like I said, I immediately stopped what I was saying and just pointed. I'm like, I, I need to see that. Uh, bring that here, please. And I, I bought it on the spot. And to this day... 10 years later or so, it's still the only copy I've seen with my own eyes. I've never seen another copy for sale at a show. Like I said, Johnny Craig, I'm a huge Johnny Craig fan, huge monster, like universal monster fan. So anytime you get a, show you the cover a little better there. Anytime you get something like a classic universal monster on the cover, I'm gonna be down. Um, so yeah, Crypt of Terror. Number 17 would be my runner-up, my number two um, favorite key issue in my collection. Number one, um, I guess I should preface this with Golden Age books are really expensive, especially Golden Age first appearances. So I really like Batman. You know, I grew up, um, like I said, in the late 80s, early 90s. Tim Burton's Batman was life. Of course, then we followed that up. We had Batman Returns and Batman Forever. And two of my favorite Batman villains are Two-Face and the Riddler. So when Batman Forever came out, I was in heaven. Yeah, it was a little kooky. That's okay. The Riddler, I don't know. I feel like there's some happy medium between Jim Carrey being crazy over here and then whatever the hell that was in the Batman. Yeah. So there's got to be some happy middle way to do the Riddler. Um, but, you know, you take what you can get. So me being unable to afford a Detective 140 or not having the right opportunity to buy a Detective 140, I settled for the next best thing. And my number one favorite book, key book in my collection, is this copy of Detective Comics 142. This is the second appearance of the Riddler. And it's his last appearance in the Golden Age. And he wouldn't appear again until Batman 171, which is that pink cover that everybody loves, um, in the mid-60s. So that story was also adapted for um, an early issue of the Batman 66 TV show. I think it might have been the pilot episode, actually. But what a lot of people don't realize is that's just the third appearance of the Riddler ever. So he debuted in 140, had a follow-up issue two issues later, and what is this? This is like 48. Yeah, this is December of 48. And we didn't see the Riddler for like 15, 17 years. I think a lot of people don't realize that. I know Golden Age and Atomic Age books aren't accessible for, for some folks, but there is a big stretch of time there where Batman, who has arguably the best group of villains in all of comics, he wasn't fighting anybody. He was any named characters. He was just going up against these no-name criminals, and there were just these wide gaps uh, of issues where none of these now just household name villains were used. And, and let's be honest, most of the Batman villains you know really well and have seen however many times up to this point, they've been around since the 40s. And for whatever reason, DC just made the decision they weren't going to use them very often. 
Um, so another example would be the Scarecrow. He was only in two Golden Age issues, and Batman 189 is just his third appearance. Uh, Two-Face got shelved for a while. There was even a period of time where the Joker didn't get used a lot. Um, so I don't know what the deal was with that, but it was just some interesting decisions coming out of DC at the time. But like I said, I'm a huge Riddler fan. So if I can get this to focus, this is just a fun golden age detective, great character. And um, yeah, probably one of my favorite books. Well, obviously I chose it for my number one. So it's clearly one of my favorite books in my collection. Now, in the spirit of the tag video, uh, at this point in time, I guess I shall declare who I tag or, you know, challenge to um, do a video like this on their own. So, first of all, I want to challenge Newbie, Newbie's Comics, great content creator from north of the border up in Canada. Um, you've seen him um, on some of the like, Comic Illuminati streams we've done, so he's a good guy, friend of the channel. Next, I want to challenge the boys with Two Brothers Comics. Be interesting to see what they can bring to the uh, the table. They've got some pretty eclectic taste, so I think that could be really entertaining for everybody. And then last but not least, let's get a uh, another Midwestern content creator on the board here. Uh, I want to challenge Steve with Burke Family 54 Comics. He's from over in Kansas. Let's see what Steve can bring to the table for his top five favorite keys in his collection. I hope you've enjoyed taking a peek inside of my personal favorite keys that are in my collection. And I look forward to seeing what else uh, pops up and what uh, some of these other creators share with the community as this tag video makes its way around. Collect responsibly and I'll see you in the next one. <music>